So, an agency like NOAA, we like to think of ourselves as a science-based service agency. So, our whole premise is being able to advise policy, take action uh, for a range of applications. Uh, the economy, safety, national security, uh, all of those. And so, consequently, we have to be able to advise on what action should be taken with regard to use and protection and stewardship of the ocean. You can't do that unless you have some understanding of how the ocean environment is changing. And you can't do that unless you have some foundation of knowledge of what the basis is for any measurement. So how can we know whether there is an impending uh, coral bleaching event unless we know what the baseline temperatures were in the past and what they are now and then build those into sophisticated models to project what it might be in the future. So the value of observation is being, is in terms of our being able to inform policy, to inform decisions, and to reduce, reduce uncertainty. Uh, and the observations are part of that. You can't make weather forecasts without observing the weather and monitoring it. You certainly can't make any predictions or forecasts about the ocean without ob observing it and monitoring it in a sustained manner. So the actions that NOAA takes are primarily based on the environmental intelligence, as we like to describe it, that we are acquiring about the ocean. So we have spent many, many years, decades in fact, developing a robust uh, observation system for the world's oceans uh, this includes drifters, it in includes uh, major arrays of uh, buoys throughout the world ocean. So right now, for example, as we're looking at the pending El Nino, how do we know the magnitude and the speed of the development of El Nino? It's because we have arrays of buoys, floats, drifters, ships, aircraft that are being used to, to make these measurements. So with respect to the SDG goals, it, it's very important for us to have the best information that describes what's happening with respect to changes in the ocean environment. And if you look, for example, at the changing, uh, the diminishing ice pack in the Arctic, uh, how fast is that diminishing? Uh, what is the variance from winter to summer in the Arctic? What are the implications of that change with respect to the biogeography of critical fisheries? for example. How is that going to affect weather and climate? You can't even begin to answer any of those questions unless you have the sustained observations and the robust models. So that's the other thing that we do. Our real niche with respect to climate change, uh, preparedness, resilience, is the predictability that we bring to the table. So lots of different organizations throughout the globe, public and private, are collecting information, collecting data, developing intelligence, if you will. We, with a very small number of other organizations, really own a responsibility for developing predictions, outlooks, projections, what-if scenarios with respect to actions that may or may not be taken in terms of things like uh, changing CO2 emissions. We would like to believe that what we are doing is serving as the honest broker with respect to this environmental intelligence in characterizing what the nature of the environment will be in the future and how that may be affected by any kinds of actions that are taken as a result of policy changes. One of the important aspects of that is uh, in resiliency. How do we build resiliency? And I'll use coastal resiliency as an example. Uh, uh, and in fact, just recently, just this past week, we put out uh, several million dollars worth of awards for coastal resiliency projects. So it's, it's founded on the concept that oftentimes our ability to respond uh, in, in appropriate manner and therefore be resilient to climate change uh, is to take best advantage of what uh, natural defenses we have, if you will. So think in terms of green infrastructure. And we've seen repeatedly, whether it's tsunamis, 
or hurricanes or monsoons that oftentimes those areas that are least impacted are the ones that have the most robust natural infrastructure. Uh, wetlands, marshes, mangroves that can mitigate the effects of storm surge, for example. So we're trying to figure out what can be done to uh, basically facilitate more of that kind of natural development, coastal resiliency through the use of natural infrastructure. And interestingly, there's some economic aspects to that as well. There's some fascinating uh, concepts with regard to use of natural infrastructure to not only serve as a physical buffer, if you will, against storms that may become more intense or more frequent as a result of climate change, but also those environments can serve as nurseries for aquaculture, for shellfish hatcheries, for example. So you can imagine that you can have a natural infrastructure, enhanced natural infrastructure, that serves as a barrier to storm surge and also may serve as a, uh, an area where you can enhance um, growth of oysters, for example, shellfish hatcheries. You get double benefit. You get economic resiliency, you get uh, environmental resiliency, and of course you get societal resiliency as a, as a result as well. So in order to understand the new blue economy, it's probably worth taking a moment to talk about the broader blue economy. And I, I like to think that there are three components to the blue economy. The one is what I would call the extant blue economy that everybody thinks of. They think of the fishing industry, they think of commercial shipping, they may think of recreation, uh, they may think of oil and gas, the sorts of things that tend to show up in discussions about the oceans and the economy. And that's a given sort of economy. The next is what I'd call the hidden blue economy. And the example I like to cite is the electrical engineer who may be developing a system for unmanned underwater vehicles. That electrical engineer tends to be categorized in the same way that an electrical engineer working on uh, heating and ventilation and air conditioning might be categorized. He's not necessarily identified as part of the blue economy. And so that, there's a number of folks who are looking at what is that hidden blue economy and how might job classifications be changed in order to accommodate the definition of those people who are working within the marine economy, if you will. The new blue economy, which is really an exciting potential development, uh, is built around data and information and environmental intelligence and really built around capabilities for providing forecasts and predictions. So imagine, if you will, that uh, through the benefit of the kind of observations we were just talking about, there now is an opportunity for somebody to develop a value-added product on predicting coastal phenomena, on predicting currents, on predicting potential for uh, uh, enhanced aquaculture and tailored to a very specific industry. The public sector is not apt to do that if it's tailored to a very specific set of clientele. But the private sector could emerge to develop those value added products if they have access to the data, the volumes of data that are now being collected. And therefore, in much the same way that commercial weather services evolved over the last 40 or 50 years. Similarly, commercial ocean services are well positioned to evolve. And that's the new blue economy that is only made possible now because we do have the kind of observational systems that are in the water, in space, um, and, and, and on, on ships. I would argue NOAA is ideally positioned. We sit within the United States Department of Commerce uh, and therefore have in our sister agencies around this department uh, uh, experts and advice and tools to help stimulate that kind of economic development. Uh, I would also argue that you can't do the kind of economic development, you can't spur new business development 
in the areas I've described without the foundation of the publicly provided goods and services, the, the free and open access to the data that we collect. But because it will be tailored to specific user needs in much the same way, again, as many of the commercial weather service partners work, they have clientele that want a very specific kind of product it's predicated on the availability of the public weather data and then they do the value add and provide those tailored products and services. The, 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 the specific forecast for uh, the New Jersey Turnpike system, for example, that has to be tailored to their particular needs is something the private sector can help provide. And in partnership with the public sector, there can be agreement on where the lines are, where the relationship, how the relationships uh, develop. I think the public sector has a responsibility to uh, not only make available the data, but as you indicate, uh, make awareness uh, uh, high enough so that people take advantage of that. And we're doing a number of things within NOAA to try to address exactly that. So certainly some of the things I just talked about uh, uh, aim toward that sort of trade deficit. You've, you've highlighted the, uh, more of what I would characterize as the tangible products component of the trade deficit. Yes. Obviously fields like aquaculture and mariculture are important components of that. And we have programs looking at that. Uh, those are not without other considerations in terms of uh, ecological impacts, but obviously there are already burgeoning uh, aquaculture programs on the West Coast. There's a hundred million dollar uh, shellfish industry that we work with very closely in terms of uh, how to enhance their bottom line. And interestingly, part of that is our being able to provide them forecasts of what ocean conditions are going to be so they can optimize their yield. The, the other, when you talk about ocean products, interestingly, um, about half of the anti-cancer uh, drug discoveries come from marine organisms and marine products. And part of the challenge is uh, once you uh, discover these particular organisms, these sponges, these corals that have unique compounds, there are, there's a whole economic opportunity to synthesize those compounds. Uh, but also there's an important component to actually discovering those organisms, finding where they are, what is their abundance, uh, how might they be collected in a research domain in order to facilitate that development. So it's a very different aspect. I know your question was oriented really primarily around the edible side, the fishery yeah. side, but there's, I, I wanted to bring up this important component that actually feeds into the need for an ocean exploration activity. One of the most important things I would argue in coastal resiliency is uh, having the ability to listen. Uh, it does us no good as a major federal agency to walk in and pound our chest and say, we've got the solution, this is how you're going to do it. So as I indicated earlier, things like the Coastal Resiliency Grants, uh, and that's a, a, a wonderful program for getting money to the local jurisdictions or the states to have them determine what works best for coastal resiliency in their area. We do this through two main mechanisms. We manage for the United States the federal component of the Coastal Zone Management Program, which is in collaboration with states. So each state has a program they develop in collaboration and in dialogue with us, and then we help manage that with them to determine exactly what kind of actions are necessary in New Hampshire versus California versus Florida. The other thing is we have a major extension and outreach activity through the U.S. National Sea Grant College program. So all of the coastal states have these programs in collaboration with universities throughout the country. That's how we have a great dialogue with the local communities, the local legislators, the local businesses about what they believe they need. We can take those dialogues with extension agents on the beach 
bring them back to our research community and say, you know, we need to look at beach nourishment, for example, as a potential tool to uh, uh, assist in coastal resilience in this part of the country. And is that or is that not a viable solution? So that's where that feedback happens through the Coastal Zone Management Program, through the Sea Grant Program, through our research activities and our collaborations with the primarily the academic research community. We have our own labs as well. Uh, we have a National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, which does a lot of work on the kinds of resilience issues we've talked about here, uh, addressing everything from invasive species and how to manage those to things like beach nourishment uh, and those kinds of physical activities as well. So our relationship with the private sector, it's one that's evolved over uh, 40 or 50 years. It's been the focus of attention from the national academies. Uh, and several years back, we put in place uh, a set of policies on how to work with the private sector. And in fact, one of the uh, really significant components of that is establishing formal bodies. Uh, so for example, our Science Advisory Board has an Environmental Information Services Working Group, which includes many of the private sector representatives you're talking about. So we have learned a lot of lessons in working with the uh, private sector and commercial weather services. Where do we draw the lines in terms of our not competing with the private sector, but still fulfilling our uh, statutory responsibilities with respect to the safety uh, and pr protection of lives and protection of property through producing for weather forecasts. Which we already have, it's not that new. I mean, we've had those for 30 or 40 years. We're really in a very interesting stage right now in terms of having the large multi-billion dollar constellations of publicly funded I would point out mostly privately built on public funds, sure, sure. Uh, satellite systems. Um, and at the same time, we see CubeSats and microsats and nanosats going up as well. Uh, Marsha McNutt, the, uh, the current editor-in-chief of Science Magazine and the prospective president of the National Academy of Sciences, has described this as a, a golden age right now because we do have the the, the legacy systems, if you will, the traditional systems, and yet we have these new systems, we won't ever have as good an opportunity for looking at the intercalibration and coordination between these capabilities. Uh, the, the idea, let's be careful and separate out the private sector provision of services from the private sector provision of data. Uh, and that's an area that deserves a lot of careful consideration. And uh, on the one hand, it's very exciting because the private sector can be nimble, can develop capabilities quickly, uh, and as we've seen, is now into the, into the world of launching and operating these kinds of satellite systems and providing data. The private sector is also in the business of having a profit, and consequently, oftentimes that nimbleness means they will be looking at different product lines and shifting. That is what makes the private sector so uh, viable and valuable. We have to be careful to make sure that just if, just because a data service is no longer as profitable as it was in the past, it doesn't get pulled out of the system. So the downside, if you will, of the private sector component is that it has to be sustained. The, the provision of data for our, our protection of life and property through our weather services uh, is inviolate. We have to have those data in order to build the forecasts that we need protect, to protect lives and property. And we can't be subject to, if you will, the whims of the profit-making aspect associated with providing those data. That's the gist of the discussion that's going on right now. So it's both exciting in terms of the quality and variability and variety of the data that might be available. But we have to be cautious about the sustained reliability of those data. And how do we, how do we build into the system the sort of checks and balances that may ensure that uh, private sector entity A 
and private sector entity B are still providing the same quality data that are required for uh, sustaining the skill of forecast that we currently have. 